In the heart of the English countryside is a sanctuary unlike any other. Monkey World in Dorset is home to more than 260 apes and monkeys rescued from all across the globe. For the last 30 years, it's been a safe haven for the victims of abuse and neglect. From the UK pet trade... Shouldn't be allowed in this country. ..to the international trafficking of the rarest primates on the planet. Monkey World has devoted itself to rescuing those most in need. This is the story of how a very special sanctuary came to be. It's a film about the park's remarkable inhabitants and the people who've made saving these primates possible. It all began in 1987 with one man's dream to end the international trade in primates. American conservationist Jim Cronin had made it his mission to stop the cruel use of chimpanzees as photographers' props on the beaches of Spain. The 80s tourist boom in the Spanish costas provided plenty of people eager for a photograph with a cute baby chimp. What they don't know is that the animal's been uh, probably working a 16-hour day, is severely dehydrated, it's been burnt, beaten up, kicked, and probably when he reaches four or five years old, he's going to be killed. Despite it being illegal in Spain, it was estimated more than 100 chimps were being forced to work in the tourist industry. Can we ask you where you got the chimpanzee from? Finners, my thing. Because it's this is hey. the, this is illegal, isn't it? I mean, just wonder. We just you like a photo? Five thousand percent. Look, look, what we, do just, you we just what we just what you we, we just want to ask. Uh, a question. Out. Hey, hey, we hey. just want to ask a Let question. Now, take oh, it oh. easy. What we are saying to the Spanish government is that we're committed to taking every single chimp in Spain. We'll take the lot, and I I don't think we can put it any more bluntly than that. We'll take all of them. Jim's battle to save the beach chimps had begun. It was a scary thing to try to do. I mean, I spent, I must have spent six years trying to, to, to raise money uh, to be able to create a park um, and, and, and do it the way I wanted to do it and keep primates the way I thought they should be kept. And then on top of having no money, you actually then announce to the world that you're gonna rescue every chimp, bar none. But once Jim had committed himself, he would stop at nothing to fulfill his dream. He found a potential site in the UK to rehome the beach chimps. And along the way, he persuaded fellow keeper Jeremy Keeling to help him. I can remember at one point when they were having the discussion as to the actual name of the place. In fact, I, I drove him down here. We, and we drew all plans for that. And I drove him down because he couldn't afford the petrol. A government loan provided just enough cash to get started, and they began turning what was a derelict pig farm in Dorset into the foundations for Monkey World. In 1987, nine former Spanish beach chimps were the first to be freed into a two and a half acre enclosure. It's a culmination of everything that we've worked for, for a very long time from the planning to finally getting the chimps here, to see them run out, fly down a hill and run up the tree, for us that's everything we could possibly want. That, that's, that's, it's an emotional thing for us to, to, to see them act like chimpanzees. They had suffered years of abuse, but within weeks, their lives had dramatically improved. As chimps go, they're okay, but they're not in what I'd call good shape, but com in comparison to what they were when they arrived, it's 100% better, mentally and physically. In your case, perhaps not. Monkey World was finally up and running, but visitors wanted more than nine chimps for their money. At home, Jeremy was caring for a four-year-old orangutan from his previous job. Amy wasn't in the park then because we didn't have any clothes for her, so she was still living with me at home. So I'd 
when things got really rough, I'd dash home and grab Amy and just, uh, hey, look, look, got another ring to, you know, ring tank. And then if it got still rough, I'd dash home and get my python at the time. And then we think it's still bad. I'd go back and fetch a buzzard that I'd rescued, you know, and then, buzzard, buzzard, and all this stuff. And then it placated a few of the people briefly, but it was, it was a bit bleak the first year. There were challenges to overcome, but Monkey World was already making a difference. Jim continued to rescue chimps from Spain, and it was then he came across the heartbreaking story of a chimp named Charlie. Charlie was one of the most horrendous things I've ever seen. I didn't think it was possible to take an animal down that low, and I was naive. Charlie had suffered unspeakable cruelty at the hands of a Spanish photographer. His story was so tragic, it caught the attention of Jane Goodall, the world's leading expert on chimp behavior. He looked to me haunted, yes, sad. sad. Mm. I could read in his eyes that he'd been through sheer hell. He's three and a half stone. He should be seven stone. He was a junkie. He'll offer his arm for a hypodermic. No one knew if Charlie would survive. He had fractured feet, cataracts, a broken jaw, and a machete wound to his head. He was brought to Monkey World, where slowly his physical wounds would heal. But the psychological scars run much deeper. I didn't think he had a chance. I honestly didn't believe he, he didn't respond to his outside environment. He didn't care. He had nowhere to go to survive, just like an abused child would, but inward, to, to survive that sort of treatment. Charlie didn't know how to interact with other chimps. The only person who could reach him was the park's head keeper. To be honest, he's fallen in love with Jeremy Keeling. Jeremy's, in fact, showing him how to act like a chimp. You know, how you stomp your feet and pound your hands. He's taking an interest in life. We're having to show him how to, how do you play? How do you act like a chimp? He's got to be taught. Charlie couldn't have been in better hands. His recovery was slow, but he'd found a lifelong friend in Jeremy. Jim continued his fight to protect chimpanzees like Charlie. It would take more than a decade for the last of the Spanish beach chimps to be saved. Over the years, the park continued to grow. And in 1992, another vital piece of the puzzle fell into place. Primatologist Alison Ames came to study how the enclosures had been set up. When I first met Jim, it was very clear that he was a man on a mission. He was pretty highly strung, wanted to show me and tell me everything about everything he was doing here at Monkey World. And at that point in time, he was actually being badgered by a coffee salesman. And on that very same day, the first day that I met him, he introduced me to this chap as his wife. Um, I went with it because he was clearly just a bullshit New Yorker. And so there we sat the first day we ever met, pretending that we were husband and wife. So, you know, I guess that sort of set the scene. The pair shared a similar sense of humor a passion for rescuing primates, and four years later, Jim and Alison were married. With Alison on board, Monkey World's mission began branching out, and the team increased its international presence. We're going to go out there and pose as potential buyers. So what we'll do is we'll be undercover, actually, funny enough, and, and we've got a very small camera that we can take with us. We spent a lot of time going around to zoos and wildlife parks that we knew were taking receipt of illegal orangutans. Their families have been wiped out. They've been ripped from their mother. They've been thrown in the bottom of a boat. Most of them have probably died on the journey, and that's what we're there to stop. You know, we want to save the babies we find, for sure. At that point in time, everything led back to Thailand. Where's he gone, honey? 
gone into the back apparently to get this one's younger brother, I think it is. It's maybe only two years old. We did a lot of undercover work trolling around, pretending to be buyers of illegal orangutans and documenting everything so that we could provide the information to the Thai authorities. And does, does the mother ever care for the babies? Oh, the mother has died already. And then, of course, the whole thing just snowballs. It wasn't just orangutans, it was gibbons, it was other wildlife. We were starting to cover the globe, basically, and helping governments to try and combat the black market trade. Through their tireless efforts, they saved countless individuals from nightmare situations. Along the way, Monkey World was gaining a reputation for their handling of difficult animal welfare issues. In 1998, they were asked to help in one of the most controversial cases they would ever encounter. Stop intruding! Get inside! Yeah, you can bloody cry. Don't start, please, sir, because I'm not in that sort of a mood. Circus owner Mary Chipperfield was secretly filmed beating a baby chimpanzee. Jim and Allison were called in to help confiscate the abused infant. First thing we heard is we got a call from the Hampshire police asking us to go with them, rescue a baby chimpanzee, and put her into protective custody. Before she was taken away, specialist wildlife vet John Lewis examined the chimp. The most noticeable thing about Trudy when I first met her anyway was she was silent, very quiet in the presence of strangers. And that's most unusual for a chimpanzee. She had a few physical injuries. The tips of two fingers were missing. The tip of one toe was missing, and she had a small lump on the back of her head. She was dazed and confused. She was limp, like a rag doll, really. If, when you interact with people, the interaction you have is generally receiving beatings, it makes sense if you hold still like a statue and don't draw attention to yourself. Trudy had been so maltreated, she was afraid of nearly everything. We often saw Trudy actually hugging bundles of hay. Animals that are removed from their mothers too soon rely on hugging hay because normally they would be hugging their mother. And in the absence of a mother, they'll, they'll have a security blanket. And Trudy's security blanket was her little bundle of hay. Despite being found guilty on 12 charges of cruelty, in a shocking twist, the circus owner, Mary Chipperfield, began an appeal to get Trudy back. Jim and Allison were resolved not to let that happen. Trudy deserves the chance to have the family that's adopted her. And anything less is cruel in the extreme to Trudy. They began their own campaign to keep Trudy at Monkey World, supported by high-profile conservationists. In the end, Mary Chipperfield bowed to pressure and gave up her fight to get the young chimp back. Trudy was safe, and the team could continue her rehabilitation. By now, Monkey World had three large chimpanzee groups, and through careful introductions, the team eventually found Trudy the perfect family group to join. One of the biggest moments is when we actually saw her adopted by Peggy. Um, and actually riding on Peggy's back, Peggy took her on, and for whatever reason, Trudy chose Peggy as her adopted mother. And she started looking to Peggy for the reassurance that she needed rather than to us. A chimpanzee can live for 50 years. What we can give Trudy, if all goes well for her, is another 40 years with her family group. It was a landmark victory for the park, but there was little time for celebration. Monkey World's rescue mission was broadening. In 2000, some of the first laboratory monkeys came through the gates. Allison was really keen. 
It happens to us. Yeah. You know, whenever you think it's impossible, that, you know, this just can't be done, you start to think, well, actually, that's why we're here. You know, that's what we do. And so we've got to have a crack at it. The 19 stump-tailed macaques had been used for research into asthma. Kept in small cages, they hadn't been able to exercise in years. You know, they were so enormous folds of great fat skin laying down to the floor. They could hardly move around, and they've got rotten, big yellow teeth. You know, they all needed a lot of work, and I just thought, I love you, but you're, but you're looking a bit ugly. And so that kind of stuck. Given the right space to move around and a good dentist, the ugly monkeys were soon on the road to recovery. As with every other primate at the park, they benefited from Monkey World's unique ethos. We see every chimpanzee, every ape here as an individual, and they all matter, and they all have their own needs, and they have a right to a quality of life because of who they are. Jim's ambition had always been on a colossal scale. Along with Alison, he was continually planning the next stage. This, without a doubt, will be the largest ape rescue center in, in the world. I mean, it, it already is in some respects. With a queue of primates waiting to come in, there was no let up in the building work. Well, we want to get ready, we're breaking ground the first of what's going to be three more phases, another 20 acres, half again. It's breathtaking in its ambition, but it's possible. It's, it's broadening out. The expansion was an enormous success, and it paved the way for Monkey World to help other sanctuaries that were struggling for space. In 2000, Jim and Allison traveled to Taiwan to a rescue center that was bursting at the seams. Ping Tung was set up to save primates who were being smuggled from the wild and exploited as pets or used in the entertainment industry. But their numbers were increasing and the rescue center was running out of room. Monkey World agreed to take three female orangs. First, Roro, then Lucky, and Xiao Kwai. They were joined the following year by Tuan, an adult male weighing 82 kilos. He'd been found wandering loose and causing mayhem in the city of Taichung. It took the authorities three days to capture him. He was taken to Ping Tung, where the team met him. The whole thing was just sort of outrageous, and out came Juan out of this box, just furious and angry and dangerous. And within 24 hours, we went back to see him, and Jeremy had got him sorted out. And this monster had turned into the gentle giant overnight. We like bananas. This is one special all right. He really is. So that whirring dervish that came out of the back of that van three or four nights ago, a bit of a transformation. Back in Monkey World, Tuan took to his new home in no time and surprised the whole team by taking the park's youngest orphan orang under his wing. It was just what two-year-old Gordon needed. He needed a father figure. He needed somebody, you know, that could start showing him how to act, how to behave. And what's been remarkable is sort of no fear Gordon. You know, he just grabs him by the cheeks and he butts him in the head. And they just, in a whole lot of ways, they've just become inseparable. He looks at Tuan in absolute awe. He just wants to be with him all the time. And Tuan, you know, sort of born family man, really. But of course, not every new arrival fitted in so well. 
<laughs> Former beach chimp Charlie had found a friend in Jeremy, but was struggling to integrate with any group. His behavior confused the other chimps. And in one incident, Charlie was badly bitten. <laughs> Charlie, that's not good at all. Bloody you got it trapped in someone's goodness. mouth, didn't you? Yes. You know, everybody's upset, and the first thing Charlie does is stick out that that hand and starts putting it in people's mouths, and, and it doesn't work out very well. Charlie ended up losing a finger, and although his wounds would be stitched up, the team needed to find a long-term solution. No one wanted Charlie to live on his own forever. He um, clearly lives in a world of his own, and, uh, you know, and that's why he needs this bit of extra looking after. I'm going to scrag you. There you go. Let me tickle your ribs. Eventually, Charlie was placed with another rescue chimp called Paquito. Show him your teeth, that'll frighten him. <laughs> and over time, the pair became firm friends. Together, they were introduced to the Bachelor Boys. And Charlie finally settled into a group. Monkey World was going from strength to strength. But there was more to be done. In 2001, while Jim and Alison were in Taiwan, they witnessed an event that would trigger Monkey World's next ambitious project. <laughs> Authorities had intercepted an illegal shipment of primates. Four baby gibbons had been smuggled out of Vietnam in harrowing conditions. It became apparent that some of the rarest primates on the planet were being stolen from the forests, and very little was being done about it. The team partnered with Ping Tung Rescue Center and the Vietnamese authorities, and plans for a state-of-the-art sanctuary were drawn up. The goal was to rehabilitate and release critically endangered gibbons and other primates back into the wild. It is a unique opportunity for Katia National Park and for Vietnam, and I love it. I mean, I just love it. Put gibbons in those trees? Come on, easy. It just look spectacular, wouldn't it? Just spectacular. Dao Tien, or Angel Island, on the edge of Cat Tien National Park, was identified as the perfect site. It's just beautiful. It's isolated, yet it's right alongside of the national park, so very easy to bring utilities and labor in to look after a rescue center. And with careful design and management, it wouldn't have to have a big impact upon the island. As with everything he did, Jim poured himself and his great passion into the project. It was an enormous undertaking, one that would take five years to get off the ground. But sadly, Jim would never see the sanctuary up and running. Jim Cronin, who founded the Monkey World Ape Rescue Centre in Dorset, has died. World-renowned conservationist, entrepreneur, larger-than-life character, Jim Cronin. Exactly 20 years ago, he founded Monkey World in rural Dorset. Jim and his wife Alison were tireless campaigners in the battle against the illegal trade in apes, as well as cases of abuse, a battle he vowed would continue. He passed away in a New York clinic after a short battle against cancer. Jim's death was a devastating blow for everyone at the park. His absence was felt deeply. But Alison and Jeremy had to find the strength to carry on. It's a bit daunting right now. It hasn't been long since Jim passed away. So everything's very raw right now. 
Jeremy's been a rock for me, and you know, I know that his heart is broken as well. I suppose you can look at it in a different way. The animals are now giving back to sort of Jeremy and I what we need in terms of keeping focused, keeping Jim's passion alive, and we're gonna do that. Jim's passion became our passion, and I'm really honored to be in that position. Chase dreams. This was Jim's dream, and it's reality. It's not impossible. Jim's dream and years of dedication had saved 118 monkeys and apes from 15 different countries. This was far from being the end. We're going to carry on. That's what Jim would have wanted, is for everybody to carry on and to keep the message going. And in the last weeks of his life, he made me promise that I would do just that. Less than a year after Jim passed, Allison and the park would face the largest primate rescue operation that had ever been attempted. In Santiago, Chile, 88 capuchin monkeys were facing a death sentence. After a lifetime in a university research laboratory, they were going to be destroyed, unless a home could be found for them. I'm sort of teetering right now on probably one of the biggest decisions Monkey World has ever made. The dean of the university where the monkeys are being kept has had an awful lot of pressure put on him by animal rights groups. We've been told that we can come over, pick up as many monkeys as we can take, and then that's going to be it. Initially, Allison had thought the park could stretch to taking 36. But now it was clear any individual left behind would be put down. There is no future for the remaining ones that we leave behind. It's a tough decision. Do we take the 88 or do you play it safe, take your 36 and leave the difficult decisions to other people in Chile? Monkey World boldly agreed to take all 88 capuchins. A new capuchin house and an extensive enclosure were constructed. With everything in place, Alison and the team were ready. In Chile, the team began the difficult task of identifying and crating all the monkeys. Jeremy thinks that we could stack six high, no problem, so I think probably okay. Some of the capuchins had spent over 20 years confined in their cages. For many, this was the only world they knew. Jeremy did everything he could to reassure them and make them as comfortable as possible for their long journey home. Yeah, you're looking pretty good, aren't you? A bit confused about what's happening now. Yes, you are. See you in a bit. Ahead was a grueling long-haul flight. A primate move on this scale had never been attempted before and it would take an Air Force transporter to pull it off. No one knew how many of the capuchins would make it, but this was their only chance of survival. Over 24 hours later, the team finally touched down in the UK. They had achieved a near impossible task very emotional time. It's the end of a long, long project. Didn't know if we would get 88 here fit and well, but I think we've done it. I think we've bloody done it, and they're all going to have a chance to live proper lives again. Perfect. Every single capuchin made it to Monkey World. All of these guys would be on the end of the needle being put to sleep if we had left them. So everybody's got a home and everybody's got a family now. We just have to hope that it sticks together and happy families hereafter. An exciting new life lay ahead for the former lab monkeys. But for others at Monkey World, the future was less hopeful. Oh. <laughs> 
The following year, one of the park's longest and most loved residents, beach chimp Charlie, was getting frailer by the day. You did like those yesterday. Those are the plums. You don't want that. What about banana? Fancy a bit of banana? Take that as a no. You're just playing with it, really, are you? He's lost a lot of weight, nearly 10 kilos, very, very suddenly. So that is the, the worrying thing as, as to why. Charlie was one of the first beach chimpanzees to be rescued from Spain. He arrived terrified of the world, and it was Jeremy who first brought him out of his shell. From that day on, the pair shared a bond that lasted more than 20 years. How you doing? That's my, yes, that's my boy. But Charlie's health was failing, and sadly, there was nothing that could be done. It was time for Jeremy to say goodbye. We had nowhere to go, so we, we ended it for him. You know, when you see somebody every day of your life, you, you, you know, they leave a void when they go. It isn't always a positive void they leave, or a negative void they leave, but they leave a void. You know, there's always a gap. For the team at Monkey World, Losing an animal is always the toughest part of the job. But in 2011, Alison and Jeremy would have something very special to celebrate. At Dao Tien, Monkey World's sister sanctuary in Vietnam, work had been ongoing. Years of negotiations with the government, months of building work, and a lengthy rehabilitation process had led the team to this point. Two critically endangered gibbons, a male called Lily and his mate, Mary, were about to take their first steps towards freedom. Trepidation, nerves, emotion, oof, it's all there, so. It's been a long time and coming. Everybody good? All right, let's go. The pair had spent years in captivity, and there was no guarantee the release would work. The female, Mary, was the first to brave her new surroundings. Mary's done what we expected, and she's flown out within seconds, climbed up the tree. But Lily was far less confident. Go on, Lily, come on. To everyone's relief, Lily finally made his move. Oh, at long last. Yeah, it's <laughs> fantastic. It was a major milestone for the team. Jim knew that a few people could do big things and prevent species from facing extinction. I think if Jim looked around and saw the center, he'd be really pleased, because we're doing just that. We really are fulfilling Jim's dream. It's very hard, but it's wonderful. In the years that followed, Doutian's conservation work went from strength to strength. Along with the golden-cheeked gibbons, they successfully released two other endangered primate species back to the wild. The spectacular Duke Langers and the nocturnal Pygmy Loris. Back in Dorset, Monkey World was tackling an ever-increasing problem closer to home. The primate pet trade in the UK was gathering momentum. Marmosets, capuchins and other small monkeys were becoming a fad in family homes. And social media was helping to fuel the problem. The trade seems to have really increased so that Monkey World is now being literally buried underneath individuals that are coming to us from cages in sitting rooms or from garden sheds up and down the breadth of the country. And it, it's quite shocking. In British law at the moment, 
really a person can keep any primate as a pet. You do not require a license to keep any species of marmoset or tamarind or even a squirrel monkey. So a young lad could go into a pet shop armed with over a thousand pounds, because that's about what the going rate is for a common marmoset now, put it on the counter and walk home with a marmoset and a birdcage. Alison and Jeremy made it their mission to rescue those in need and educate the public about the cruelty of keeping these primates as pets. The park's numbers continued to grow, and in 2010, they would make room for the largest primate pet they would ever take in. In South Africa, 13-year-old Oshin had been living in the lap of luxury. Owner Brenda had got her from a safari park in Indonesia and raised Oshin as one of her own. But as she got older and bigger, Oshin became more difficult to discipline. She ate everything she could get her hands on and became dangerously obese. Can I have the biscuits, please? Tough for Mama. Brenda was killing her with kindness. For both their sakes, Oshin needed to move on. For Oshin, there's no doubt in my mind that Monkey World is the very best place for her to come to. Not only do we have three different groups of orangutans, we're used to dealing with very unique circumstances with individuals that come effectively with baggage. Brenda agreed Monkey World was the best place for her. And the process of getting Oshin safely back to the UK began. All right, here she comes. Fruit and veg would replace her donut diet. And she would soon be introduced to other orangutans. There you go, that's her sort of letting them know that she's here. Oshin was finally in a place where her needs would be understood and met with world-class care. Monkey World's expertise with orphaned orangutans was well established. In 2005, they'd been asked to play a critical role in the European breeding program. We were approached to be designated as the crash for orphan orangutans, so if any babies are born within the European region whose mothers don't care for them, they will instantly be sent to Monkey World to grow up with others of their own kind. Alison's primary goal was to break the cycle of abandonment. If you're an orphan, what we do know about orangutans is odds are that you will orphan your own baby if you were an orphan, because it would appear to be half nature, half nurture. The idea was to ensure orphans grew up with other orangs, and through socializing, they would learn some of the skills they might need as parents in the future. Oshin was eventually placed with an energetic young orphan called Sylvester. He had come from Santiana Zoo in Spain, having been rejected by his mother. But Oshin wasn't entirely sure what to make of Sylvester to begin with. She was a little bit unsure at first. She really just didn't know what to do with Sylvester. But what was clear is what we've always known about Oshin. She's actually got a really lovely temperament. And once, you know, we took things slowly and she could see that he wasn't going to be a challenge or a threat to her, she welcomed him with open arms. Sylvester brought out Oshin's maternal instincts, and over time, the pair would become the closest of companions. Across the park, the team were keeping a close eye on another very special species. Woolly monkeys are among the rarest primates here. Elsewhere in captivity, their numbers have drastically declined. They suffer from hypertension and social stress. And with less than 40 woolly monkeys left in the worldwide captive population, 
they're facing extinction and captivity. Over the years, the team have focused their attentions on creating the right environment and providing enough space for females to breed. With careful design and management, they've started seeing remarkable results. Of the 12 breeding females left in the world today, eight are found at Monkey World. It's knowledge Alison hopes will help other sanctuaries. If I could help rescue centers where they're all dying in Peru, Colombia, Brazil, then that would be a good thing and maybe those animals could be taken back out into the wild like we're doing with species in Vietnam. Monkey World's primary focus is rescuing individuals who have either been smuggled or need our help or assistance for whatever reason. But as it happens, we're pretty good at breeding our own and we've been very successful. But being part of the European breeding program has meant inevitably some of the park's woolly monkeys and orangutans have had to move on to other homes. Chowning doesn't realize it, but over the past week or so, she's been trained to go into her traveling box, and in the next half hour, she's heading out to Germany to start a new life with two others. It is sort of like the kid leaving home for the first time. It's really sad and emotional, but I'm sort of excited and pleased for her because I think she's going to have a really good opportunity. We finally graduated now two different groups, if you will. Our first two ladies, Xiaoning and Dinda, went off to be rehomed at Rostock Zoo in a beautiful brand new orangutan area. Our second group went off to Spain, which was Kai, Jolie, and Linga. And as it happens, I've only just had news back that Xiao Ning has given birth just in the last couple of weeks and is caring for her baby perfectly. Xiao Ning's a Hmong, which makes Roro a grandma, and all of us very proud. Xiao Ning has become the first orphan from Monkey World's crash to raise her own baby. It's a sign of hope that the team are on the right path. What will always remain true at Monkey World is the original ethos that Jim and Jeremy set out from year one, and that is that the individuals are everything. They share our emotions and giving something back and trying to address what somebody else has put wrong is the right thing to be doing and it's why this park was set up in the first place. The once derelict farm has given hope and a future to hundreds of abused and neglected primates. If Jim were looking down right now, I, I'd like to think he were pleased at everything that we've achieved, that we've carried on with the original mission and plan that he set out, and that each individual that we bring here to the park, we care about as part of our extended family. What began as one man's dream has grown into the largest sanctuary of its kind in the world today. Jim's mission has transformed the lives of many. But Monkey World's work is far from finished. Alison and her team will continue their fight to protect the most vulnerable primates on the planet. We're a rescue center, a sanctuary for lifetime care. We're here to pick up the pieces of animals that have been smuggled from the wild, who have been abused or neglected, and need our help. Jim's dream continues.